I went to China as a British Council exchange student. There were just 10 of us exchanged for 10 very serious Chinese students who came over here to learn to be diplomats and very high level cadres. Um, I had some idea of what it would be like because I had visited in China in, in 1971 with a student tour, but really it was a bit going into the unknown. Um, you know, China was still in the throes of the Cultural Revolution. Beijing was really still very rural. It was like being in the countryside almost. Um, you know, on the outskirts of Beijing you could still see camels um, carrying coal. Uh, there were all these donkey carts and, um, and mule carts bringing vegetables into town. I mean, right into town. Um, they weren't allowed usually on places like Chang'anjie in the, day, in the sort of height of daytime. But um, there were virtually no cars at all. I mean, there were lorries, there were buses, and there were bicycles. I mean, it really was basically the land of bicycles. And people's lives were very simple. I mean, they were quite restricted in the sense that people didn't have much in the way of a, a money income. So they didn't have much to spend. And then, of course, there wasn't much to spend it on. I and mean, one of the things I remember very strongly is, you know, that you would go into a shop if you needed a pair of trousers. Um, you, a, you had to have cotton coupons. A lot of things were rationed. So you had to have coupons for, for cotton. You had to have, for quite a lot of foodstuffs, you had to have coupons. Um, and then you had to have the money as well. But then again, you know, there would only be like sort of two types of trouser. You can either have this trouser or that trouser. And there wouldn't be, you know, like a blue one or a gray one or a green one, maybe three the three different colours, but they would all be the same otherwise. If you took a jacket, I mean jackets, there would just be women's jacket or men's jacket. Um, jacket with four pockets or jacket with two pockets. And so little choice. So it was a completely non-consumerist society. Um, but you had a beginning of a sense that people wanted a bit more, I think, by then. By 1976, I think people were were fed up with there only being two types of trousers and there only being sort of one type of shirt, you know, that, that kind of thing. People wanted a little bit more in their life. I think in those days, because, because of things like the Cultural Revolution and people, were, people had been shown pictures of red guards, you know, going through Tiananmen Square like this and sort of that, that great sort of horde of people, um, people were very scared of China in a, not I suppose in a way that they felt that they were going to kind of be invaded personally because China was very turned in on itself. But, you know, it just seemed, I think, to people in the West, a completely alien society. Um, you know, they got used to Russia. Russia was kind of drab and communist. But China was really quite scarily communist in that the Red Guards seemed to be quite brutal. Um, you know, and there were reports of dead bodies floating down the river at Can in Canton and so on. So people in the West in general, I think, were very, very, very wary of China. They, of course, they knew almost nothing about it. There was, it's not like now, where you get news about China all the time. But in those days, I mean, there was nothing, no news came out of China. Um, and nobody much, I mean, they, the newspapers did keep correspondence there, but they didn't report anything in a way that was in any way immediate to people. Um, so I think for it, people in, in Europe, it was a scary and alien society full of people they really felt they couldn't understand, you know, there were all these kind of characterizations of the Chinese all being the same, like blue ants, you know, they all wear the same clothes, which was to a large extent true. But I mean, obviously wearing the same clothes doesn't mean you're the same people, but that uniform look of China frightened people into thinking that, you know, everyone in China had been brainwashed completely. So people were very worried when we went off to China as you know, students. I mean, family, some people's families were really, really concerned. Um, I returned to China the first time only about a year later taking a, accompanying a tourist group and throughout the late 70s and into the 80s um, I came back to China maybe two or three times a year almost invariably at the beginning with tourist groups because I couldn't afford possibly to travel to China myself and also because 
you needed permits for everything. It was much better to go with a, a travel group. Everything would be arranged by the China travel um, set up, Lu Xinxia. There was only one in those days. It was just one official travel agency in China. In the 19, late 1970s and early 1980s, um, because of the way people were, had been so terrified of China in the Cultural Revolution, the people who came on these tours were quite adventurous, really. They were going into the unknown. They didn't know what they were going to find. I think is the most amazing thing um, were, were the changes. Um, it, it became, in certain areas, China changed very quickly after 1976. Um, I mean, I, my interest was in um, architecture, particularly in housing, domestic architecture. And one of the things I noticed immediately, in, you know, it, it, it also appeared in things like Beijing Review from 1977, 1978, that people in the countryside, peasants, were building new houses. And it was obvious they'd got quite a lot of money eventually stashed away because it had been so difficult to spend money for so long. Um, peasant families had quite a lot of money and they all started building new houses. And these were really new houses. They were houses that reflected sort of the housing taste of the new territories in Hong Kong. So there was this sense that people had money and also in the shops things started to change too very quickly. Um, fashion started to appear in a very sort of gradual way, more choice of things. Um, and that was something that you, I had had a sense of, even in the end of the Cultural Revolution, that people were desperate to buy more things, to buy different things, to get hold of um, something different from everybody else. They didn't want all to be the same as they'd had to in the Cultural Revolution because there was sort of no alternative. So you started seeing all sorts of things. People, people started having their hair curled as well. That was quite quick. I mean, I would say in 78 or already, you started seeing even men having perms and so on. Just, you had a sense with a lot of, particularly young people, that it was as if they'd been in a very repressive convent school and they were suddenly let out and suddenly they were going to let rip. I mean, people started wearing high heels as well. Um, women's shoes started having heels, and even men, you would see them with quite stacked heels. I think it was enormous. Um, the, the effect of the opening up policy was to, was indeed to open up China, open people's minds a bit, open up the possibilities for ordinary people. Um, and that you had a sense of immediately. It was hugely obvious everywhere in building that, you know, I think kind of by the the sort of mid-1980s, people would say things like, you know, the hundred largest cranes in the world are all working in China. You know, the building spree, China's towns started changing dramatically and growing into these massive cities. There'd been a sort of a slowdown on building, particularly things like housing in the Cultural Revolution. And people were living in all sorts of funny places like old shops and things like that. But, you know, suddenly there was this release of building power and all over China you've got skyscrapers and great tall blocks of flats going up and tall blocks of flats because they had lifts in them before you, they'd only been able to build up to so high because no, there were no lifts whereas now you know there was this kind of economic power of being able to buy lifts and install lifts and it, it was um, a really dramatic sort of obvious transformation in cities and towns right the way across China, which, which you can still see today. Um, so Deng, the effect of Deng Xiaoping's opening up, I think, was, was absolutely massive, particularly on the physical appearance of China. Immediately you could see China was different. What was wonderful was that people, even if they were still living in fairly small flats, suddenly they had their own hot water, their water systems, they had running water in their flat, they had a fridge, they had a television and there were things that they quite wanted to see on television. I mean, before 76, I mean, you could have a television but we wouldn't really want to watch it because there wasn't anything ever on. Um, so people had in material terms, people's lives improved dramatically. For most people, it was just the standard of living just went up through the roof. It was fantastic. At work, when I was working in the British Library, um, 
one of the really interesting things was the opening of China meant that Chinese scholars were finally able to come to the UK um, in larger numbers. We'd had one or two, you might get to one or two vis official visits a year before, but after, after 76, and well really several, in the late 70s and through, especially in the 80s, Chinese scholars who wanted to come and look at Chinese collections in Europe, particularly for example, um, the collections of materials from Dunhuang, they were able to come and we, we used to often try and find, we used to find money for them so that they could come and stay in England for a year so that they could really research the areas of the Dunhuang manuscripts they were interested in. And I mean, we must have had, you know, half a dozen scholars staying for a year or two years, often, as I say, with support from this side. At the beginning, they were very poor. They didn't have access to much in the way of money um, and weren't used to living abroad. So it was quite a kind of, quite a business looking after them. But it was absolutely fantastic. I think it, it completely opened up Dunhuang studies. The, this ability of Chinese scholars to come over and look at the original materials. And then we embarked through, through their insistence on publishing programs, publishing facsimiles in China. So, um, yeah, opening up meant in the sense that my, my work opened up hugely and you know, gave me a chance to get to know China's foremost Dunhuang scholars, really as you know, friends over a long period. It was, it was great. I think the, the greatest thing has been the kind of the greater openness of China, the fact that you know that sort of mass tourism, well not exactly mass tourism from Europe but to China, that people have been able to go to China over the last 40 years in the way that was very much more difficult before that. Um, it, also now of course you get um, mass tourism from China to Europe um, and I think uh, that sort of greater openness of China has meant that people are less worried about China. Seeing lots of Chinese people amongst us, obviously, is a different thing. I mean, I remember in, it, this was before I went to China, in about 1974, I used to teach a group of students. They must have been one of the first lot who came over as British Council Exchange students to England. A group of Chinese students who were, um, I used to go and teach them in the Chinese embassy. And they were very kind of formal students and this was 74 was still quite serious cultural revolution time and they wore you know they definitely wore what we would people would now call Mao suits you know, it, and we I remember they came to my parents house and we took them for a walk on Hampstead Heath and they were so obviously mainland Chinese because of these Mao suits that people did absolutely you know turn and, and gasp at them what are these six mainland Chinese, this group of mainland Chinese people doing, people were so unused to them. Whereas now, you know, you've got Chinese people everywhere, Chinese people in your school, Chinese people at your university, um, Chinese tourists, uh, it's Chinese academics now throughout British universities. So um, it's a completely different, no one would kind of sort of turn on their heels and stare at a Chinese person going past, unless and perhaps they were wearing a Mao suit. But um, so people's, people's perceptions and people's closeness to China has got far greater and I think it's, it's, it's obviously a very good thing.